in Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. God's word says this. A son honors his father and the servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name by offering polluted food upon my altar? But you say, how have we polluted you by saying that the Lord's table may be despised? When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you? Or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. And I will not accept an offering from your hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, who is the embodiment of your word, Lord, who is everything that you are. And you've manifested him to us, Lord, in his coming to earth to be perfect for us, to stand in our place and to die in our place and to rise again so that he is our righteousness, so that his death is our death, his resurrection, our resurrection. And Lord, that is the reason that we can speak to you now and that we can boldly approach your throne. That is the reason that we can worship you now correctly, God, is because of what Jesus has done for us, Lord. And so, Lord, for your church, you constantly correct us and you constantly reform us and you constantly bring us into line with your will, which is, uh, Lord, according to your nature. And so I, Lord, I pray, Lord, that today you would Teach us of Christ. Teach us what you wanted to know. Correct us, rebuke us, challenge us, or break our hearts over our sin so that we may be more like you. Let us go away, Lord, with the confident assurance that Christ is gracious so that we may have motive to be transformed. For those that don't know Christ today, God, I pray that you would awaken them, Lord, from their slumber that you would remove the scales from their eyes, Lord, and unplug their ears and change their heart loads so that they can see you for who you are, hear the word of Christ, and have the heart to believe it and, and trust Jesus as their Savior. We pray this all for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, go ahead and be seated, please. The sermon is titled, God's Love for His Name. God's Love or his name. Earlier this week, I had a terrible nightmare. It was a nightmare about my preaching. I know some of you are laughing because you're thinking uh, your preaching is a nightmare. <laughs> but but that, that's not what I mean, okay? It was a nightmare about the sermon that I'm about to preach. In the dream, I was about ready to read the text just like I did a moment ago. And in the dream, I was unable to read the text because the words on my transcript, which I'm looking at now, were too small. My glasses weren't helping. And so I couldn't read the scripture. And so I grabbed a physical Bible somewhere in this dream. There was the biggest Bible that the earth has ever seen, like a family heirloom Bible. The pages are heavy in those, right? They're huge. And if you've ever turned one of those, you know what happens when you turn a page, a bunch go with it. It just carries all the pages. And so... The weight of these pages, every, when I tried to get to Malachi, kept moving the pages back and forth, and it was taking me forever in this dream to get to Malachi. Finally, when I got to Malachi, I tried to read the text, but the letters were all jumbled up in calligraphy. And so I was fumbling over my words in this dream, and I thought uh, to myself, just slow down, man. Just read carefully. This is God's word. 
And as I read the text slowly, none of the words made sense. And they came out in a jumbled order. It was an odd dream to say the least. But what bothered me most in this dream was that I felt that somehow my inability to read God's word effectively, that it was disrespecting God, that it was dishonoring to his name. And maybe just because of the past couple of weeks, I've been studying this so much that, that that's just how my, uh, the Lord was working in my heart to make sure that I, as a servant of his, don't ever disrespect him or dishonor him. And somehow that led over into my subconscious and my dreams. It was just weighing on me. And so in this dream, I felt that I was unintentionally hindering the worship of God and that this was unintentionally making a mockery of God. In short, I felt it was dishonoring his name. And it was troubling me. And that's why it was a nightmare. You see, church, the, the love of God, or by that I mean the worship of God, is what we were created for. We were created to know and to worship God for who he is. Our God is worthy of full devotion. Our full devotion and obedience. And this is radically connected to the gospel of Christ, which I hope to make clear today. There is no more important thing that we can do than to properly worship God and to love him and his name. And as we look at the scripture today, we're going to see how the Israelites and the priests, we're going to see how they dishonored God's name and why this mattered so much to God. And in seeing this, I pray that we come to the reality that Christ, um, that that we understand Christ in a way that we may not have before or that we haven't given maybe much thought to in relation to Old Testament sacrifices. My prayer is that today, that you come away with appreciating Christ for what he has done in reconciling you to God. That's always my prayer. But I also pray that you'll know what it means to properly honor the name of the Lord. And I think you might be surprised, based on the text and what we draw from it, it might not be what you initially think. You probably know some of this, but I think... I think we're going to open up the scripture in a way that you might not be used to seeing it. Okay, and you might be surprised that true worship is more about Jesus and less about you. Now, the last sermon that I gave, which was two weeks ago, we started Malachi and I gave you a 20 minute introduction to Malachi by going from Genesis all the way to Malachi, because Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament before we get to the New Testament. And so the context of the entire Old Testament, you're, you're going to see this played out a few different times as we go through Malachi The entire context of the Old Testament is important to set up our understanding of the prophecy of Malachi as it relates to the overall story of Jesus Christ. It's all connected to Jesus. I'll give you the two minute version. We started with creation and God walking with mankind in the garden. Then we see the Adamic Adam, the Adamic covenant, which promised death if total obedience, total worship And total love for God wasn't displayed. You with me on that part? Don't forget that. Okay. It's important to the rest of the Old Testament. Then the redemption covenant comes in. That's the promise of a savior to fix what Adam destroyed. What Adam lost in his failure to love God perfectly. And that moves us towards the Noahic covenant. The covenant that God made with Noah in creation. And that foretells and foreshadows a coming judgment of Jesus. Not by water but by fire. Then we move to the Abrahamic covenant. And in that covenant, God promises seed and land and blessing to Abraham, which is fulfilled in none other than who? Jesus Christ, which is followed by the Mosaic covenant, which details a whole lifestyle and culture that leads us to Jesus Christ. But also it's a covenant with blessings and cursings, depending on how Israel lived according to this covenant. And then we see the Davidic covenant, which God promised an eternal heir, an eternal heir that would sit on the throne forever. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All these covenants have their finalization in Jesus Christ. And then we move to the New Testament where we see the new covenant told about in the Old Testament and the old covenant with Jesus as the mediator between us and God. All right. King Jesus as savior over the Jewish and Gentile population of believers by believers. I mean, those who trust in God to save them, trust in Jesus to save them. And this new covenant is made up of a new kingdom of born again people who God changes 
and changes their hearts and puts his law on their hearts so that they will never break covenant again with him like Israel did repeatedly. So we can't break covenant with God. That's part of the promise of the new covenant. And each of these major stops in the Old Testament with these covenants, with each of them, we get greater and greater detail of God's salvation plan to the world. Okay, how we are restored to God through Jesus Christ so that we can be presented to God. Listen to this so that we can present be presented to God in perfection once again so that we might regain through Christ what Adam lost for us in the garden, which is intimacy with God. Those are important things to remember, church, that Christ cleanses us from sin so that we can be presented to God so that we can stand before God in perfection with the perfection that he gives us because we can no longer be perfect because Adam ruined it for us all and we've ruined it ourselves by our sin. Okay? Hang on to that. We saw in our last sermon that Malachi is taking place after the 70-year Babylonian period in which the Jewish people were exiled from their land. They were foreigners in another land. And God was punishing Israel for violating the Mosaic Covenant. But now, for some time, they've been returning to their land. And they've rebuilt uh, the foundation, albeit a smaller one. They've rebuilt the temple. They've reinstituted sacrifices. They've rebuilt the wall. They've rebuilt their culture and their way of living. And now they're living with God. Yet they have become complacent. With God. And through the prophet Malachi, God addresses some problems he has with Israel. The first problem he addresses, I mentioned earlier, is that they do not believe that God loves them. God refuted that and showed them how he has chosen them above another nation called Edom. And how God judged Edom to the point where they would, they would never be able to rebuild their society again. Yet God allowed Israel to do so. And so God was using this as evidence that he does love them and how he's always loved them. And we connected that to God's electing love for all believers, that God has loved us and chosen us to be saved and rescued and to be showered with his grace and affection whereas other people have not. We should never doubt the love of God for us Therefore, based on our circumstances, because God has chosen us, chosen to love us by sending Christ to die and rise again so that we might be with him forever. And so we ended last sermon, the last sermon with this truth that Israel's knowing the reality of God's love, his electing love. God said it's going to result in their exaltation of God, their worship of God. Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel, they would say. This, this really is the story of redemption, all right? How God showed a special love to Israel so that through them, Jesus would be born in the entire nations of the world. The entire nations of the world would proclaim that God is great, that Jesus is Savior, okay? So this is the story of redemption. God using Israel to lead us to Christ so that he might be the Savior of all nations. And so too, we learned that our worship must be great, Our worship of God must be great in light of God's electing love for us, not just Israel. And so now really from this point forward in Malachi, knowing that God loves Israel and they are wrong for saying that he doesn't love them, God is going to flip the script and he's going to show the opposite to be true, that it is Israel that does not love God in the story of Malachi, in this prophecy of Malachi. And so this... This next accusation, because there are several of them in Malachi, and they all come from God. This next accusation that God has with Israel has to do with just that. And so we're going to see just how it is that Israel does not love God. They despise his name, Scripture says, which he intends for the nations to know. God's name is something that he loves. And so we're going to see just how it is they did it, that they did not show Uh, love for God's name properly. Now, today's passage, it is part of a much larger section that extends into chapter two, but we're going to break it up into three different sermons so that we can explain it appropriately. And so now we come to the next problem with Israel. We see the accusation of not loving God's name. 
The accusation of not loving God's name. The first verse six says this. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests who despise my name. Immediately, the Lord mentions two human relationships to show the Israelites and the priests the problem that he has with them. In the realm of earthly relationships, a son typically gives honor and glory to his father. In other words, there's typically a value or a worth or a weightiness ascribed to the father by the son. We're talking about human relationships. The son normally considers his father to be a person worthy of being taken seriously and thus gives him honor and glory. He sees worth in his father. Therefore, he is worthy of a certain type of action from the son. The servant does the same with the master too. A master is Lord over the servant. And the God of heavenly hosts, the God of angelic armies, that's what it means when it says Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, innumerable angels, ask them a question. This is the second time in Malachi that God has been referred to as the Lord of hosts in just a few verses. And once in verse four, which was last sermon, and then right now, and it's going to be used four different times in today's passage. This name is being used in a way to exalt God in the minds of his hearers. Okay, this name. It's as if to say, don't you know who you are talking to? Don't you know who is talking to you, I should say? It's the Lord of hosts. One worthy of respect and honor and worship and fear and reverence. Don't you know who's talking to you? This is the Lord of hosts. This is Yahweh. And he's ruler over the entire cosmos. He's ruler over all angelic beings. The army of angels, the innumerable population of angels, bow before this being that is addressing you. Where is your fear and awe and reverence of this being? And the question that the Lord asks them, the Lord of hosts asks them is, If then I am a father, where is my honor? Similarly, if I am a master, where is my fear? God is once again taking the natural relationships that they all knew well and says, if this is how you function within the confines of human relationships, then why don't I, God Almighty, who is greater than your fathers, greater than your masters, why don't I get what they get when they are lesser than me? I am the Lord of hosts. If these lower relationships get honor and fear, where's mine? Where's my honor, my fear? You priests who despise my name. You see, Israel was called sons of God ever since the the son of God, ever since Exodus chapter four. And since then, God truly loved them, we see in scripture. For a long time, he's loved them and put up with them. So where's the love to their father who rescued them? In redeeming them out of bondage, out of the bondage of Egypt from an evil ruler, an evil, an evil master named Pharaoh. That was his title. God was not just their father, but now he's also their benevolent master, their benevolent king. Thus, they are his servants. So where is his fear? Where is the reverence due him? And that's what we mean by fear, reverence, the awe, the amazement. The wonder of beholding God. That is what rightly belongs to him. He is worth that. So where's that attitude? Where's that mindset in them? Instead of loving God, the Lord of hosts says that these priests have actually despised his name. In other words, they hold the name of God in contempt. Okay? Contempt. That's a feeling that something something or someone is not worthy of consideration. That's what contempt is. Let me say it again. It is a feeling that something or someone is not worth considering. When a judge holds someone in contempt of court, we've heard that phrase before, right? We've watched uh, uh, CSI or whatever those shows are. Where they're, uh, what's, what's the one where the, the show goes, ding, ding, and it takes you to a courtroom? Law and order. Law and order. Yeah, right? That was the w- horrible impersonation, but you all knew what it was, right? <laughs> 
I'll come home from work and my wife might be watching and ding, ding. Like, <laughs> what did he do, right? Sometimes in those court situations, we hear the judge holding someone in contempt. And what the judge is saying is that by someone's actions or someone's speech, they are saying that the court of law is being treated without dignity and respect. That's what it means to be held in contempt of court. All right? When you're supposed to give respect and dignity to the authority of law, which is weighty and serious. So it's to dismiss it. Like this is, you're stupid, judge. And this whole court case is stupid. And this whole law thing is it's, it's, it's beneath me. And so that's shown by your actions. And so the judge will hold you in contempt. So the priests, to, the, to them, God's name is beneath them. Not worthy of considering. It's not deserving of honor and fear and dignity. Really what we mean is it's, God is saying it's not worthy of worth. Worship. Worship. That's what worship means. Recognizing something as worthy of a, a certain way of living and talking and thinking and acting. That, that that being is worth that. That's what worship is. It's ascribing worth to something. And to not worship God, and, and by the way, we can worship God in a variety of means. Some are wrong, some are right. All right? But to not worship God is to really hold, to, to hold him in contempt. Okay, let me, let me just forewarn you, if you don't like feeling uncomfortable, you might want to leave now because there's certain points in which your toes might get stepped on today and mine too, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Andres. Right. I thought my wife was going to be the first, all right? <laughs> just giving you a heads up, okay? We're not worshiping God is, is the same as holding him in contempt. Okay? So if you don't want to sing to God, you literally despise him. You hold him in contempt. Do you, do you hear that? If you don't want to sing to God, which that's the, one of the ways that we're instructed to worship him, you hold him in contempt. He's not, worth, he's not worth you opening your mouth and giving him praise. You despise the name of the Lord. If you don't want to give to God, you hold him in contempt. If you don't want to listen to God's word, you hold him in contempt. That is to say that in some sense you despise the Lord. You don't consider him worthy of your honor, reverence, your, your adoration, your attention, your mind, your thoughts. And so you see that so far in Malachi, God has had two problems with them. You don't believe that I love you, number one. And two, you don't love me. You despise my name. So to despise God's name really is equal to not worshiping God properly. That is the problem. God is not held in high esteem in their hearts and minds of the priests of Israel, nor the people and it's important to know that he's addressing the priests, but not the priests only, as we'll deduce in a bit. He's addressing the, the Kohens, the Kohens, all right, in Hebrew, right, the priests. We have a brother here, Al Cohen, right, his wife Martha, their, their last name in Hebrew is priest, okay? I didn't know that. And likely, maybe you didn't either. Now you'll never forget it, okay? Al priest, Martha priest, all right? And God's accusation is that by not honoring him as father and not revering him as master, they are dishonoring his name. This begs the question, what's in a name? What's in a name? For you and me, it might just be what our parents decided to call us. Okay? For God is different. It's God's essence. That's what his name means. It's his essence. It's his nature. His name is I am. What does that mean? I exist. God ascribes names to himself that says who he is, what his attributes are, what his nature is like and character. Jehovah Jireh, God, my provider. God's name is not just what we call him. It's who he is. He is Lord. He is sovereign. He is salvation. He is. So because God's name is his essence, his attributes, his nature, it stands to reason that his name is not to be, to hel to be held in contempt then, right? Right? Because his name is who he is. To hold his name in contempt is to hold him in contempt. His name expresses his greatness. So it ought to be revered, honored, respected, not used in vain. To regard God's name uh, is the equivalent to regard it properly is the equivalent to having high regard for God then. When prophets spoke in God's name to the people, the people were to listen as if God were to speaking directly to them. As they're speaking in God's name, representing him. That's why we're to have high regard for the preaching of God's word. 
It comes to us directly, not from me, okay? Not even from the pages that we read or the apps that we open up on our phones or on our tablets. It comes to God through his prophets to us. You listening to God's word then by the prophets indicates whether or not you regard his name properly. Thus him properly. Does that make sense? Okay. But if it's, if it's God's name that reveals his nature, it is God's name that reveals his nature, which is congruent with his acts and his deeds. And these priests have despised God's name. And the most amazing, beautiful reality of human history is that God has made himself known to us. And the most horrific reality in human history is that we have all despised God and his name. Who he is. Well, how have we done that? How have we despised God's name? That's a great question. It's the same question the priests have who asked that back to God after his accusation. Remember, it's God answering for them because he knows their responses. He knows their hearts. So it's really God providing all the dialogue here. But let's look at that again and hang on to your seats because we're just getting into the uncomfortability section of it. Okay. Number two, we see, number one, we see the accusation of not loving God's name. Number two, we see the denial of not loving God's name. God accuses, they deny, but God provides their dialogue. He says, but you say, how have we despised your name? God answers for them and their response is not sincere. It's defensive. It's not as if they're genuinely concerned, genuinely concerned that they may have mistakenly or accidentally despised the name of God. God's accusation is that this is deliberate and his tone is not that they have made a boo-boo. But that they are seriously in rebelling to God on purpose. This will be made known more clearly in a bit. The truth is that we may not have recognized how we have despised the name of God. Most of us here, like the priests, would say that we love God, that we have never despised his name or failed to worship him. But maybe it's time to allow God's word to really shine the light on our lives so that we can see how we have shown contempt for our Lord in his name. And while the priests have, in essence, denied that they have not failed to love God's name, God is going to show them the proof of not loving his name. And so our second point was very quick. Okay? Number one, we see the accusation of not loving God's name. Number two, we see the denial of not loving God's name. And then number three, we see the proof of not loving God's name. And this is where we'll spend the majority of our time together today. Now, the proof of not loving God's name is shown by their polluted offerings. You don't love my name, you despise it. How? Here's the proof. You give me polluted offerings on my altar. Now you have to remember that the law of God that he gave to Israel in the Mosaic Covenant in regards to worship and sacrifices, okay, it's, it's all in there. This is all part of the Mosaic Covenant. And it was given to Israel in light of God freeing them from the Egyptians. Remember the Exodus, right? God takes them out into the wilderness and it's there at Mount Sinai that God gives his covenant to Moses and then he passes it on to the people. Okay? God freed them and liberated them from the tyranny of Pharaoh and their idol worship. And so now God is their king. God is their king. He is their sovereign. And Israel is now required to lovingly obey the God that loved them and freed them and liberated them from their misery. That only makes sense, right? Am I right? Someone helps you out of your oppression and misery and they, they rescue you from that. Man, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to love that person back? That, that's what's going on here with Israel. God required them to lovingly obey him. And this covenant came with rules, which they were to obey. A lot of them to show God that they were subordinate to him and also to show God that they loved him for the redemption and salvation that he gave. Understanding that you can see why God would accuse them of despising his name. Their violation of the covenant clearly says they aren't loving him correctly. Their obedience to it is to show that they love him for that. How have they and the priests violated the Mosaic covenant? By offering polluted offerings on the altar. 
Now, before we look at the practice of burnt offerings, and there's several different kind of offerings in Scripture, um, and some of them have to do with uh, offering animals and things like that, but we're going to specifically look at this one. Um, it doesn't look like uh, this is talking about the Day of Atonement or anything like that, but we're going to look specifically at burnt offerings. And before we do that, though, I want to hit pause for a moment, okay? Just stop here for a second at this offering thought, and now we're going to travel backwards to the Adamic Covenant, okay? Because it expresses what is due God and why the Mosaic Covenant was very important in particular parts as it relates to what happened in the garden, okay? In the Adamic Covenant, going back to the creation scene, God talking to Adam and Eve, you remember that God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day that they ate of it, they would what? They would die, okay? So if they had never eaten of it, and if they had obeyed God perfectly, if they had loved him perfectly, if they had given his word honor that he deserves, if they had showed God that he is worthy of listening to and serving, in other words, if they had worshiped God perfectly, they would have not died and lived forever. Do you get that? I need you to make that connection. Had they been a continual living sacrifice to God, that God, you are worthy of my total obedience and love. Therefore, this is how I will act. I will not eat of that tree. I will give you what you deserve, which is total allegiance and worship and love and affection. Had they done that, they would not have died. All right? Had they honored the name of the Lord, then by doing what he required, they would have lived forever and never died. In other words, once again, had they continued to worship God perfectly for who he is and what his name represents, they would still be alive. Yet Adam and Eve despised the name of the Lord. And at the heart of the Adamic covenant was the promise of eternal life if they worshiped God perfectly by presenting their lives to him as living sacrifices, not dead sacrifices, but living sacrifices. That is to say that they were to continually offer up their, listen to this, they were to continually offer to God every day their sinless lives to him to give glory to the sinless God. Are you following that? Okay. It's crucial that you get this. That is what God is worth. Total and 100% perfection from all of us. That is the only thing he is worth. God required living sacrifices, not dead sacrifices, to show that he has worth, that he is worthy. And at the moment that anything less than perfection was brought before God, they would suffer death. He made us in his perfect image and likeness. Therefore, that is the only thing he deserves. Nothing short of that is acceptable to God. Do you hear that? Nothing short of that is acceptable to God. Nothing. He requires absolute, I'm, I'm, I need to drill this in your head so that you can understand what's happening here in Malachi. He, ha, he requires absolute perfection in order to approach him because he is absolutely perfect. Now let's look at the burnt offerings and their purpose in the Mosaic Covenant and let's bridge that together. In Leviticus chapter one, right from the get-go in verses one through nine, the Lord gives instructions to the Israelites and to the priests. These are about burnt offerings from a herd. The people were to bring this burnt offering to the entrance of the tabernacle, this bull. This tabernacle is not a word we use a lot, but it's a movable tent. And it's a movable tent where God dwelled with the Israelites. And this bull offering was to be without blemish. It was to be perfect without sickness, without scabs, health issues, or defects. It was to be perfect. Why? Because God demands perfection. And he is worthy of perfection. To make it even more personal, God required perfection from the Israelites. Be you holy, for I am holy. Just like he required perfection from Adam and Eve just like he requires perfection from us. Because the Israelites could not present themselves as perfect living sacrifices to God. 
They had to bring an animal of perfection to God that would stand in their place. This perfect bull stood in their place and represented what they were supposed to be. Perfect. Are you with me? And because they deserve to die for their sins, not only did this bull stand in their place as a perfect substitute, symbolically giving glory to God for what he is worth, all right? Not only did it do that, but the bull stood in their place as the one that would die in their behalf and it would do for them what they did not want to do, which was to suffer the penalty of God. The bull did for them what they wouldn't want to do. And that's why the burnt offering had to be perfect, okay? It's what God is worthy of. Now, we know in scripture that this was, we're gonna to get to that, all the point towards Jesus Christ, that the, the blood of these animals never, and the sacrifice of these animals never really took away sin, but it ceremonially cleaned them. You might even say symbolically cleansed them and helped them to be able to approach God, okay? Now, this is what God is worthy of from this covenant perspective with Israel. And these perfect offerings were brought to the entrance of the tabernacle. Later, that would be a permanent building called the temple. But it was brought to this movable tent to the entrance. And the priests were supposed to inspect these offerings and ensure that it was a fitting offering. Fitting for God. These perfect animals and only perfect animals would be accepted by the Lord. And the Israelite was to, according to Leviticus, lay its hands on the head of the burnt offering. Okay? This would signify that a transfer of this animal to God, that this is going to you, God. I'm offering this to you. All right? But this transfer, this putting on of hands also signified the transfer of sin, that the Israelite sin is going on top of the animal. Offering a perfect animal before God as a representative of what they could not do, and then offering this animal as a sacrifice for the penalty that they were to receive. But it would go to the animal instead as their sins were transferred symbolically by the laying on of hands on this animal. The bull would be killed before the Lord. And the priests and his Aaron's sons would take the blood and they would throw it on the side of the altar at the entrance of the tent of meeting, this tabernacle. The bull would be skinned and cut into pieces. The altar would be lit on fire and the priests would be arranging the wood on the fire. That was part of their duty. And then they would arrange the pieces of the sacrifice, the head, and the fat. They would put all that on the fire. The entrails and the legs, they'd be washed before being placed on the altar. And all of it was burned on the altar as a burnt offering to signify that God is consuming this, that God is receiving this. It's as if he's eating it. Because it was offered to him and the aroma of the burnt offering would go up as a pleasing scent to the Lord. And so the problem is not just with the priests here and offering defective animals. The problem is with the Israelites. God's accusation is that the priests have despised the name of the Lord, have not worshipped him properly. How have they done that? By offering polluted offerings from the Israelites on his altar for burnt offerings. And guess what? They continue to deny that they were worshiping, worshiping him properly. How have we despised your name? How have we polluted you? They understand that, that to do wrong is to sin against God, but not to just pollute stuff, but to pollute God, if that could even happen. But that's how it's seen here, as if they're desecrating God. So the proof of polluted offerings is denied. They're denying that they despise God's name. How have we despise your name? By offering polluted offerings. How have we done that? They're denying this. How have we polluted you? How have we defiled you, God? How have we desecrated you? They are picking up what God is laying down. You despise me. To offer polluted offerings is to despise God and they're treating him with contempt. They have committed sacrilege. They have polluted him. And we have this same denial in the form of a question. They're just denying it all over the place by their questions. How have we despised you? We don't think so. How have we polluted you? That's not possible. We emphatically deny it. And remember, all this dialogue is coming from God. He's making the accusation. He's responding for them. 
because he knows their responses. He knows their hearts. He knows their motives. And so he provides the dialogue and shuts them down and just heaps further proof upon them, as we'll see right now. They're basically saying everything is good. And God is going to, second, uh, for a second time in this accusation, reject their denial by showing them what sort of offerings they're bringing. All right, he's going to also show them another analogy. He's going to shut down their worship in just a second. So we see this denial of the, the, the second accusation. It's all part of one accusation, but phrased a little bit differently. We see that this second denial is repudiated by God. He, he stops it and he shows them how the Lord's table is despised. He says by, look at the next part of the scripture, part of the scripture. It says, by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Okay. How have we polluted you? Well, you guys, you guys say that the Lord's table can be held in contempt. Be despised. Despised and contempt are the same thing in this passage. And if we remove the dialogue from the priest, so let's just take that out for a second. We can see that the accusation is going like this. Okay. You despise my altar. By offering polluted offerings on them, thus showing you despise my name, me. You despise me. Okay, let me say that again. You despise my altar by, by offering polluted offerings on them, thus showing you despise me, my name. The priests literally have no regard for their duties to lead the people to worship God correctly. It's a horrible situation. God is worthy of their perfection. He's being treated with contempt. He made a way for them to bring perfection to God, to himself, because they can no longer do so since the fall of Adam from his state of perfection and into sin. They cannot bring God perfection anymore in themselves. And now they're not following God's pattern for perfect worship and how they may approach him and on what conditions. Instead, they're basically the priests are basically teaching Israel that it's OK to have small and dishonorable feelings and thoughts towards God. And it's OK to not listen to God. It's OK to disobey him. It's OK to bring imperfection to God. Which means they despise God. And our God is not worthy of that at all. And so God makes it clear how the priests are teaching others that it's okay to treat God this way when it's not. And they despise the Lord's table by offering blind, sick, lame animals. Look at verse 8. They're saying that they don't, that they do love God's name. He's like, no, you don't. You despise it. How? By offering polluted offerings. How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. And then he shows them how they're despising the table. Verse 8 says, when, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Again, the priest's job is to inspect the offerings brought to them by the people of Israel and accept them if they were perfect and to reject them if they were sick or blemished. We see that in Leviticus 27 and Leviticus 22 and Deuteronomy 15 all throughout uh, the, the, these books that describe the covenant that God has with Israel. The people are bringing to the priest animals that are blind, saying, God, this is what you're worthy of. This is what I think of you. They're bringing gifts that are crippled. Lord, that's how much I think of you with this, this gift. And they're, they're bringing disease and sick animals to God. Do you see what they feel and think towards God? They have better, and yet they withhold that from God, and they bring this to him, saying, we love you, Lord. No, you don't. Is that not evil? Of course it is. Why? Because God is worth perfection. This is a big deal to the, and to the priests and to the people. It was not a big deal. It's a small matter to them. They truly do hold God's name in contempt. To them, he's not worthy of perfect offerings. God doesn't deserve them. That's why earlier I said that God was addressing the priest directly, but indirectly, he's also addressing the people. Both are at fault in this blistering accusation. People are bringing cheap and defective offerings because it is more beneficial financially for them to keep the better animal and to offer the defective one to God. And while it may have been better for them financially, spiritually, it spells disaster for them. And you'll see the correlation to us in a bit, I promise. So by offering improperly inspected and thus improperly offered offerings, 
and sacrifices from the people, the priests have shown that they despise the Lord's table. And thus they have disrespected God, which shows that they don't love him or his name. And to put the final nail in the coffin, God gives them one last analogy to show them how much they despise him. He's going to stop their arguing. He shows them the blind, lame, and sick animals. And now he's going to show them another relationship to show how they despise his name. And it's a lesser relationship compared to their relationship with God. Verse 8 continues. Present these gifts. Present that, blind, lame, and sick animals. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now... Entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. Meaning, it, it, and I'll explain in a minute, but and now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? So he's hitting directly at their heart. He's not asking them to repent, okay? He's telling them, let me explain, okay? God is challenging the worthiness of their gifts by saying, would you present these to your human leader? Of course they wouldn't. Remember that the Israelites are under Persian rule at this point in history. And a Persian ruler often had a table that people would bring offerings to, food offerings, in order to incur the favor and the grace of this governor. And suppose you needed kindness and you needed benevolence from a Persian governor, you priests. So do you see the illustration that God is painting from this section? Okay. The governor or ruler would host a dinner in which someone would bring food to be eaten in order to gain favor from the ruler by declaring his worth via the quality of the meal presented to him. And the meal would be served by the servants. And in the worship of Israel, listen to this analogy, all right? In this worship of the burnt offering, God is the host represented by the governor in this little story here. God is the host. The altar, then, is the table in which food is presented on. And the priests are the servants serving the food brought by the people of Israel. Do you see the correlation there? All right, nod with me just so I know you're with me. You see it there? Okay, good, good, good. All right. And so the people are bringing the food of the offerings to declare the worthiness of God and bringing great sacrifices in order then to gain the favor or the grace of God. And the priests were the one who presented these sacrifices on the altar and burned it. You don't do that to your governor. You don't accept garbage gifts from the from the people and set it before the governor. If if that's that's okay, it's not. Right. This is an altar. God's altar is it's a table that enables fellowship to happen with the king of kings. And the fellowship meal was trash, showing the Lord that he is unworthy in their eyes. You with me there? Therefore, do you suppose they will get that favor that they're seeking? That grace from him if they presented to him the polluted offerings of the people? Bring that sort of offering to me, the Lord of hosts says. Your father, your master, the one who is greater than a Persian governor or king, the one who redeemed you from Egypt, Entreat the, fa- entreat the face of God. Come to him with that to see if you get any grace. Do you suppose you will receive the favor of God with your blind, crippled, and diseased animals? Do you? You say I'm worthy and that you love me and this is how you show it? You don't love me. You bring junk. Doing their duties correctly didn't matter because God wasn't big to them. The goal of these gifts was to incur the favor of God towards the one giving it. They were, they were trying to, these were, this was a sacrifice of atonement. They were trying to remove the wrath of God by offering him something that showed that they thought highly of him, that he is worthy of perfection, okay? Church, now, this isn't the point of today's sermon, what I'm about to say, but it, it does show our, our, our tendency to be sinful, Okay, what I'm about to say, and that's what I want you to get from this. That we don't, as human beings, we don't give God properly what he deserves. Okay? There there are times when our lives show nothing but contempt for God. There are times when, as musicians, and 
you notice at our church, we don't call anybody a worship leader. We're just a, a, mu- a music team. Um, if you want to call it a worship team, we just facilitate worship here. But uh, there are times when us musicians, we show God contempt by not practicing our music ahead of time. And we kind of show up and we kind of wing it. Is God worthy of a half-hearted effort like that? No. It can show contempt. It shows that we don't hold him in high regard. That he's not worthy of our time during the week to prepare for this. If, if we stay up late, and, and this is us as in general. If we stay up too late on Saturday night goofing around watching TV and playing video games. So much so that we fall asleep during church while God is speaking to us by his word. Does that not show contempt for God? Guilty. Have we all done that? Probably. At some point, n- name your vice, your entertainment that keeps you up and tired on Sunday morning. Wake up, honey. Sorry, I was up late last night. That shows contempt for God. If, if you're YouTubing, listen, if you're YouTubing during service outside or inside and playing games or posting on Facebook, does that not show despising of the name of God? I told you it would get a little uncomfortable in here. If we aren't singing for God's glory and we're just standing there staring at words, is that not despising of God's name? If we are chatty during the sermon, is that not despising God's name when we should be listening to him? Yes. Please tell me what is more important, what you got to say or what God has to say. If we prefer to be lazy and not come to corporate worship, Listen, this is for all of you listening online that are, are, are not cool with coming to worship together with God's people as he has instructed us to do. If, if you'd prefer to do that, is that not contempt for the Lord? Yes. Is our disobedience to God's word after it is preached? Is that not a despising of God's name? What about grumbling when we, dis- when we serve others? What if we're not serving in any ministry? Is that not a despising of God's name? Does that not show we despise, that we despise the Lord? What about our lack of giving? Does that show contempt for God? Yes. I'm uncomfortable. I want to leave right now. <laughs> Do you see that our disobedience to God shows contempt for him? Do you see that? He's worthy of what? Perfection. Perfection. Your absolute perfection, 100% obedience, nothing short will do. Now, we might go out of here and sing louder for our favorite bands at a concert. And thus we give them more respect than we give God. We might shout for our football team or baseball team. If anybody watches baseball these days or football, I don't know. We, we, I, I, man, I know people get up and hoot and holler. Because they're worthy. I mean, he, he just hit a ball 5,000 feet. He just, he just ran a 90-yard touchdown. He's worthy of me shouting and screaming. You go to a movie? Man, I'll shut up for two and a half hours to watch Thor beat up on Thanos. <laughs> Shh. Quiet. This is awesome. We give more respect to the world than we do to God. Do do you hear that in the text? That God is calling out sin. Like Israel, we give more respect and time to worldly people and to worldly things to God. Lord, help us. And he has. God has helped us. In Israel's case, they refused his offerings. Why? Because these particular offerings will not achieve what they had hoped which is to receive the favor of God. Listen, in bringing the best offerings to the governor's table, it wasn't a bribe. It was a confession that you're worthy of the best. And that in that confession, grace is found. Yet Israel, by their improper offerings, they failed to confess that God is worthy. And thus they did not receive the grace of God. Instead, he refused to accept their offerings. Verse 10 says, oh, they... That there were one among you that would shut the doors. That you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. Do you see God's response? Shut the entrance to the tabernacle. It's vain. It's pointless. 
to bring these defiled offerings to be burned on the altar. They cannot and will not achieve what you need. You bring them to get grace and favor, but that's not how this works. You don't get grace and favor by insulting your ruler, do you? Neither do you get grace and favor by insulting your creator. Our disobedience insults our creator. God would not accept it from them. And he would not accept it then. And he would not dispense grace. And no atonement would be made for that Israelite. Because of the improper offering. That is the point that God is making. You bring them for atonement and grace. Therefore, nothing less than perfection is acceptable. Let me explain to you the point of this passage. Because there are many, this has been preached so wrong for so long. Does the truth that God deserves our best worship, is that a true thing from Scripture? 100%. Okay? God deserves our best worship. And many people, that's all they do with this passage is that you got to sing louder. You got to sing harder. You got to give better. You got to put on your best Sunday attire. And you got to watch how you talk when you come to church. And you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to, because that's what this passage is saying. It's saying that to the Israelites. But the, the meaning is much more than just do better. Okay? God deserves the best. They bring him defiled offerings. That's the point that we got to cling on to. Remember, that, that, that offering was to represent them. In bringing polluted offerings, they might as well bring themselves to God with their sin and say, this is what you are worthy of. Did you get that? The offerings had to be perfect because they weren't. Sorry, bull. You're the best I have. You're perfect. You're going to be holy, quote unquote, holy before God in my place because I can't I don't look as good as you. I, I may I don't have blindness or sickness or crippleness, but I got lust. I got hatred. I got lies. I got I got spiritual scabs and, and wickedness all throughout me. And I can't go to God and say, here's my best. Accept me because that doesn't. Get anything from God. You know what that gets? It gets judgment and damnation. When you come to God with who you are, the way that you are. So what do we do? That's the point of this passage. It's, tr it's trying to teach us. Okay. That it's not okay to come to God in our sin thinking God will be kind to us and just, Lord, here I am. Here's my best. Here's my best that I can do to try to please you. What is God worthy of? Perfection. And just like they needed a substitute perfection in front of them, we need a substitute perfection presented to God on our behalf. And who is that perfect representative? Amen. Amen. You try to bring God your best and all you're bringing him is crippled, lame, and blind sacrifices. The only thing that will do is perfection. And that's why Jesus came to live to be a perfect, uh, a perfect representation of humanity on us, uh, on this world for us. Do you get that? That's the point of this text. That is the point of this text to point you to Christ, not to point you to you. We're the problem. Christ is the solution. The Israelites would get ceremonially cleansed from their sin so that they could approach God. But that never really took away their sin. That sacrifice only point, pointed forward to Jesus. That perfection only pointed forward to the perfection that Jesus Christ would achieve for us. And just as they would bring that perfection, an animal, to God, and they would have atonement. They would get ceremonial grace from God. Symbolic grace, if you will, from God. They were doing that as they look forward to the perfection of Christ and his sacrifice. Because as we stand here in God, the only thing that will allow God to show grace and favor to us is not our good deeds because they're garbage. Not our attempts at pleasing God because it's garbage. We've already failed. But it's to stand, have the mediator, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ with his perfect obedience stand before us and God. So that God gets what he deserves. Perfection. Do you see that? He gets what he is worthy of and only Jesus does that for us. So, and that's how we get the grace of God. That's how we present to our almighty governor and our king, 
God the right sacrifice so that God does not show, so that, so that we do not despise God's name. Church, the only way to properly honor God's name is with 100% obedience. And since you can't do it and I can't do it, Jesus has to do it for us. And just like these priests, they were receiving and accepting the wrong types of offering, the showing they despise God's name. If we try to approach God with anything else but Jesus Christ, we show that we despise the name of God. This is the message for us. This is the message for the world that they cannot come to God without perfection. And only Jesus Christ can do that for them. Do you hear that? Nobody talks about this passage like that. Am I right? How many of you, raise your hand if you've heard this passage preached before? Nobody? Malachi, a couple? I've heard it preached many times. And all it is is just start doing better. That's not the point of it. It is to show you that you despise God's name if you reject Jesus Christ as Savior. If you reject his sacrifice. If you reject his perfection. Yes, bring God your best singing. Yes, Bring him your best financial gifts. But that means nothing if you don't first admit that you're a sinner and you need the perfect lamb of God to be your righteousness. It means nothing. Through Christ, we can only worship God properly. Do you hear that? We can only worship God properly through Christ. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. That's why we confess our sin and admit that he is the savior. That's why we sing songs that are gospel focused. That's why we preach the scripture from a Jesus-centered perspective, because that's the only way that we can properly talk about and honor and worship God by proclaiming Christ, perfection for us, crucifixion for us, death for us, and resurrection for us. That's the only. That's all we can bring to God. It's literally like every Sunday we bring God, Jesus Christ, and herald Jesus Christ, so that God is pleased. Amen. All the world religions are trash. And junk, and they try to approach God without Jesus Christ, and they get no grace. It's only through Christ that we get grace. This passage totally just, I don't know, it just blew my mind. Being a better worshiper is a good thing. But worshiping through Jesus Christ is the right thing. It is the perfect thing. The only way that, that God is completely satisfied with us. And it's out of that that our acts of love flow to God, that we know that Jesus is perfect for us. You did for me, Jesus, what I can't do. I'm, I can't bring myself to God apart from you. And I only get grace when you stand before God as my representative, my perfect representative, giving to God what he's worth, loving his name, not despising it, and then dying and getting what I deserve. You're, you're my double substitute, Jesus. Jesus. My perfect substitute and then my substitute for death as my sins are transferred to you. And only through that will I get the favor and the grace of God. And it's not based on anything I've done or you've done. It's all based on the representative standing before us. And that's why God says, you priests, you despise my name. You bring stuff that's supposed to represent Jesus and it doesn't represent him. You bring stuff that represents you. Is that amazing? Yeah, this, this, this floors me. This, this humbles me. This changes you, I pray. I, today's text isn't about wearing your Sunday best. And that's how I've heard it preached my whole life. That we should just shut the church doors when we don't sing right songs or good songs or with a perfect heart. The text is about knowing that we have no fellowship with God unless the best and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ is presented to him. And that we trust that he pleases God, that he removes God's wrath from us so that we can have the grace. Proper worship recognizes the worth of God, which entails receiving Christ as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. To believe that anything else in this world is better than Christ is to despise the name of God and to get off cheap. And God loves his name. And on the basis of Christ being our perfection and substitute sacrifice, we love God and we desire to please him more through our actions. Church, may we continually confess our sin to God. And as we confess the righteousness of God, all right, we, we worship God properly. And that is why we gather every week to confess our sin and to hear again how we are absolved through Christ's completed work. This is proper worship. Hearing this, in confessing this, 
This is why we sing songs of Christ's perfection and death and resurrection. So again, it's why we preach Christ-centered sermons, gospel-centered sermons, Christ-centered sermons each week. Because we cannot worship God properly apart from Christ's saving work. And to approach God apart from that just won't do. That's why Christ must be central to our worship times together. Because apart from Christ, we can't approach God. And our worship from God is not received. To not see Christ as the perfect Savior is to despise his name. And church, that's why we love him. And that's why we worship through him. For anyone here that's not a Christian, I pray. I pray that I've made it clear that you have no more important duty in life than to worship God. And for that to happen, you must believe that Jesus is your Savior, your perfection, your sacrifice, your resurrection. In your belief and in your confession, you'll get what you want and what you need. God will grant you grace and favor, which means your sins will be forgiven. And you'll be reconciled to God. And God will grant you eternal life so that you may enjoy him forever. In the new creation. Getting you back to God is what Christ came to do. There is no higher goal in life than to know and to love God for who he is. And that means loving his name. God loves his name. And that shows that you love his name when you receive Christ as Savior. So do not despise God any longer. Come to him through Jesus right now. I beg you as we have. Now church, we're going to receive communion in just a minute. Receiving communion... It's part of loving the the name of God. When you receive communion, you receive the bread, which represents the broken body of Christ. You receive the juice, which represents his blood, the fruit of the vine. And when you partake it, you're saying, I believe that Jesus is my savior. That's the only reason I'm taking this. You are worshiping properly as you take communion. Right? Christ is my perfection who died and rose again for me and is coming again. He is my king. He is He is worthy of receiving as perfect savior and sacrifice. And so I'll tell you what, taking communion is a great way to honor the name of the Lord and to show that you don't despise his name by by continuing to acknowledge your receiving of Christ as savior. So connect what we just learned in Malachi to communion because if all the scripture is about Jesus, then all scripture is going to point us to communion because communion is a picture of Christ crucified, buried, and risen again for us, Right? It just flowed together so naturally. No, it didn't have to force a connection to communion. It's just just there because Christ is the substance of it all. So let us continue to receive Christ as Savior as we have once and for all. Let us take this as a reminder of what he has done for us. Amen? Amen? All right. And let us sing this final song that we're about to sing. That for now and all time and forevermore, Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray.